one question. Um, where did I say that it was a tall order to reverse these? June 13th, <laughs> 2012. I have a, I have a quote. Are you talking about the oral argument before Judge Serio on renewal where I told him it's a tall order to ask a judge to reverse himself? I don't believe so. Well, uh, that's where I said it, and the judge pulled me aside afterwards, and he said, he said, don't worry, Mr. West, I have to reverse myself all the time, every time my wife gives me a certain look. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to give uh, Helen a chance to answer that question once she gets her yeah, notepad yeah, up. In the meantime, I'll just say that, well, okay, let's give Helen another. I think there's a question in the meantime. Okay, and, and I have a question too, but I don't want to get too far away because I want to give both Helen and time. Was supported law360.com as a quote from you by Pete Brush. Cuomo backs home rule is cracked and deal shapes up. Okay. All right. Um, thank you, and thank you to our panelists. Now that we had it all cleared up, uh, <laughs> pretty straightforward, right? Uh, I do have one question uh, for Steve, and then we'll open it up uh, to the floor. And uh, this is a practical matter. We've talked a lot about the legal aspects, but um, land use plans, comprehensive reviews that uh, Steve was uh, advising municipalities to come up with to strengthen their case, whether it, uh, for, for uh, regulating um, uh, gas wells. Uh, that takes money, of course, as does uh, enforcement. And I'm just wondering, from a practical level, uh, could you speak a little bit to the ability of a municipalities uh, to enforce the rules? How does that play into their uh, success in regulating them? Well, uh, first of all, everything takes money. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Uh, and there's a policy decision that needs to be made by every municipality as to how important uh, this issue is. If, there, if the locality believes that this is an activity that should be undertaken uh, at all, I think Tom uh, speaks correctly in saying that there is a substantial amount of tax revenue that would be yielded from high producing wells and that could conceivably offset uh, some if not all or maybe generate a surplus. But that does not answer the policy question for a municipality, it simply says that if you're going to get into this activity, you may very well see a significant income stream and might, uh, might uh, justify uh, the investment up front in terms of intelligent planning. As far as enforcement is concerned, most municipalities have enforcement staff in place, but it is likely that they will either need to have more specially trained enforcement staff or perhaps hire additional enforcement staff. Uh, to the extent that they are imposing local regulations that require local enforcement. I don't consider local enforcement to be a revenue raising measure. I would try to discuss that with the uh, town of Thompson that has a 55 mile an hour speed limit on Route 17 that's trapped me once or twice. Uh, <laughs> but uh, as it really shouldn't be considered a revenue measure and you really have to do enforcement for the public good, not for revenue raising. Okay, uh, let's take questions, uh, okay. I'll speak loudly. Um, Steve, you mentioned about um, uh, industry, and I've been trying to find a real good, solid <coughs> legal definition of heavy and light industry. I'm not finding that, and I, I've been looking across the different states. Uh, is, is there any source that you can give me to look at to find the difference? Yes, and when you email me, I'll be happy okay, to give you some you. sources. But let me, let me just say uh, that the reason that you're not finding a single definition is because these concepts are malleable. Um, there is no hard and fast line between what is considered heavy industry or light industry. And the types of industrial activity that could occur in individual communities varies geographically. It also varies over time. We're not undertaking the same type of industrial activity that we had 150 years ago in this country today. So the concepts are intended to be malleable and intended to uh, change over time. What is more important than having a hard and fast definition 
is that if you are going to regulate these types of activities, that you do so in a manner that is not strictly limited to hydrofracking, but deals with industry more generally. How you draw that line, what industries you look to sweep in or not, is something that's more appropriately answered on a local level of what types of industrial activity do you typically have in your community. All right? And that's really where your focal point should be, rather than starting at some hypothetical or theoretical definition that you have to apply slavishly in your local community. Tom, oh. can I uh, just sure. supplement that? So there is no, uh, even if you look in zoning de dictionary books and they're out there, there is no single definition of heavy industry, high impact uh, industry, and the like. You do have to be very careful if you go that route in having a very specific and enforceable definition. If the definition is not well drafted and it is vague, then it's really not going to be applicable to anyone. Um, anyone who you say it's applicable to can, can argue against your statute as being ill-defined and, and void for vagueness. The uh, town of Bethel in doing that, uh, trying to uh, take the high impact industrial use approach, used SIC codes and identified particular industries by SIC code. That's one way to do it. Um, other towns, uh, our first model on this, identified 10 or 12 different negative impacts that a town might find from, from heavy, in, heavy industrial uses and said, if you have six or more, pick a, you know, eight or more, five or more, some number, of these sorts of impacts, because these are what we're concerned about. If you generate these impacts, then you're a high impact industrial use. So th there is no form out there, but if you look, Middlefield tried this, their laws online, Bethel used SIC codes, um, but you have to be very, you don't want to just say something like heavy industry or high impact industry without having a really good definition. Okay, and what we'll do also, I think it'll be helpful and interesting if people could state their name and uh, what they, who they represent or, or where they're from, and we'll go retroact retroactively with you. Ma'am, I'm sorry, you? Judy Falsoy, Avon, New York. Okay, um, up here? Yes. Hi, I'm Chris Kale. I'm a, a community and economic development planner working mostly in central New York. I wanted to ask uh, regarding road use agreements that you've um, suggested are a good idea. I do a lot of work with, uh, with farmers who are in most cases the existing users of roads in these rural areas and um, one of the things that, that we've looked into that we find particularly problematic is what's, what's termed improvement of roads frequently is um, beefing them up, if you will, adding layers of substrate and, and increasing the capacity to, to handle heavyweight trucks. Uh, in many cases, that actually changes the profile of the road such that you have, say, about a three-foot drop from the surface of the road to the farm fields surrounding. And um, again, you know, looking for uh, an approach that, uh, that has a, a town board strictly in, in uh, private consultation with one industry. I, I'd like, again, and you know, I'm a planner, so I tend to like the idea of public participation and everyone being represented. Uh, but would you recommend if you, if you have other industry farming or other kinds of industry uh, within your community currently using the roads, that they also be a party to how the roadways are changed? Absolutely, uh, for a couple of reasons. First of all, the requirements that you're going to be dealing with uh, that are road standard related are going to apply to all users of the road, uh, agriculture as well as other commercial operations, as well as those making deliveries, uh, all type construction vehicles, so your road uh, requirements, if you're going to uh, designate certain haul routes, you're going to have requirements for maximum weight limits and a variety of other things, will have impacts that are felt by all users of those roads. So uh, if I left the impression, and if I did, I apologize, I was not suggesting that other stakeholders and users be excluded from the process. 
What I was attempting to suggest is that one needs to understand from industry in your community what level of activity is anticipated and for what duration of time, what types of vehicles would you expect if there were to be hydrofracking? And then this is something that can be done as part of your comprehensive planning process where you do look at this on a more global basis to make sure that all of the uh, transportation related issues and particularly safety issues uh, and grade changes are certainly uh, appropriate as well are taken into account when you formulate your, your policy. Uh, the, the reason for doing this, and I want to stress this here because I don't want I'm gonna, if you give me, I'm going to use your question for just a moment to digress slightly. I don't want the audience here to be confused by the two sets of legal arguments that are being presented uh, as to whether or not municipal zoning laws do or do not allow you to regulate industry in a manner that if you prohibited heavy industry, you could sweep in uh, hydrofracking in that. The courts are going to decide that. You're to take the issues back home with you this way today, and I don't think anybody would disagree with what I'm about to say. Your comprehensive plan can be amended, period, regardless of what the courts say your zoning powers are. If for no other purpose than simply to say to the DEC, in its review of site-specific applications, how they are going to process the environmental assessment for a particular application for hydrofracking. Okay? At a bare minimum, you want to at least be able to say to the state, is or is not a particular application going to be consistent with our comprehensive plan? Period. Okay? Now, if it, what the impacts are of that in the state process, we don't know because the regs are not fine. But if you want to have any voice at all, you have to do that. All right? Now, the second point is, is that if you then go forward and say, all right, we want to just take the state's uh, decisions of the Supreme Court, and we're going to assume that they're law for the moment. Yeah, we might have problems in the future, but those are the only decisions that are out there now. You can be guided accordingly and adopt a land use law knowing that if the appellate courts turn out some uh, turn out with a different holding, you may have to go back and modify it. Okay? Tom, but that's the takeaway right Tom, just, now. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, I, I want to, okay. Just very briefly on road use maintenance agreements. Um, it's it's a it's an agreement, so it's wide open to those discussions and it's wide open to including other stakeholders. And just like Steve cautioned uh, municipalities in terms of how you regulate, you have to do equal even-handedly, you have to do the same with transportation. So if you have a farmer that has an 80,000-pound milk truck coming down the road every day and you limit the roads to 40,000 pounds, that has to apply equally to the farmer and, and the gas industry. That, that's refreshingly clear. Plan, 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 right? Okay. Uh, one more question over here uh, in the blue shirt, and then we'll have to uh, express preemption. How much of an intent does the legislature have to specify in order to have the industry claim that the legislature has expressed preemption? It, it, it can be found from the express language itself, and I don't think you draw the circle based upon the semicolon, you draw the circle based upon the entire supersession provision, but it, you also have to look at the remainder of the statute. So the reason I put the definition of waste and promoting the development of the resource and protecting the correlative rights of landowners is to say you cannot have a ban on drilling and uh, promote the development of the resource and protect the correlative rights of the landowners at the same time. The, the court has to look at all of those statutory provisions together to determine preemption. Okay. Um, Well, the, the legislature expressed whatever they expressed throughout the entirety of the oil and gas solution mining law, and that's what will be interpreted by the courts. Uh, if the legislature wants to come back and revisit the issue, then you go back to the policy debate of whether municipalities should or should not have that authority, and we're not, we're not litigating that issue. We're litigating what the, what the legislature has already said. Express, express preemption 
means that there is an express statement, thou shalt not. It's pretty, it requires pretty clear language. Otherwise, it's implied preemption or conflict uh, preemption, dealing with the field. Express preemption means that the state legislature is telling you, you can't do this. Okay, we're going to have to, we're going to have to leave it with, with that. Um, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but we're on a tight schedule. But there will be a lot more of this to come. Uh, the next session is going to be effective local planning tools. So uh, some of these questions can also be asked then. Well, it was nice to meet you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.